Hello, and welcome to the Trial Guides Tip of the Day this Thursday, December 28th, 2023. My name is Michael Leeserman. I'm here today with David Ball to read today's tip from his classic, David Ball on Damages, which is now in its third edition. Juror anger. Juror anger is our best antidote to tort reform. Tort reform is not a phrase we hear as much today as we did in 2010, I think, when that book was written. You don't hear the term as much because the defense and the insurance companies have wised up and used that term less. But the forces of tort reform, of showing that you're evil, that you're greedy, that you're going to drive all the doctors out of state. Uh, uh, this year, there are going to be several state initiatives come up to cut, put more caps, remove uh, uh, limitations to what you're allowed to ask for in damages. Because of the tort reform movement, this stuff doesn't just happen by itself. You're going to get into trial, and it's no longer tort reform as a lobbying thing. Uh, they use a legislature to limit what you can ask for. That's a different area that people need to work in. And thank God for the trial organ, trial lawyer associations, the associations for justice that are dealing with those things. Um, I should not you be able to ask for doctor bills, maybe in some of your cases. Um, but once you're in trial, that feeling of anger on the part of so many people about what you lawyers do, terrible things. You are, you're, you're making a living of the suffering of other people and the cost to us all is enormous and that's why insurance rates are so high and I have to use a PA and not a doctor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They blame it all on you. That's even why big pharma is such an evil force because your lawsuits have driven them to be evil forces. Go figure. But you can't fight the public policy battles in trial. You can't however fight for your jury. And the one thing that will offset, not the one thing, one of the things that will really help offset the anger against plaintiff's lawyers in general and the system in general is there's an anger at what the defendant has done caused the injury. If you frame it the right way, we don't want you getting angry at the jury or in front of the jury. We don't want you displaying your own anger. That's like watching a little kid have a tantrum. Don't do it. We want you to present and frame the information to the jury in ways that gets them to be angry. For example, consider the fact that every act of negligence, whether or not it causes harm, every act of negligence that is done when you're not alone, every act of negligence is an act of disrespect of other people. And one of the worst things you can do is to disrespect other people. And when you disrespect the whole damn public by who you hired to be a driver for the truck, or by how you drove your car, or by how you did that surgery, whatever it is. You must respect the people who depend on you to simply exercise ordinary care. And when you frame it that way, then you start to get the jury angry. Let me give you another example. I'm sure you've heard, may have heard the phrase, try the lie. Well, you know, I think what's clear by now is that jurors don't really mind lies. I would cite political proof of that, but that's not what we're doing here today. But jurors aren't really that exercised when they hear about lies. What they cannot take and what they will get furious at is when they feel that you or your witnesses are lying to them. So it's not enough, for example, just to show that the defense causation doctor is wrong. That's nice. That's useful. It's necessary. But that by being wrong and trying to foist it off on the jurors, 
He is disrespecting the jury. May not be able to say it in exactly those words, but you can come pretty close. Uh, there's a section in the stuff in the damages and there's other stuff in the uh, damages evolving book about how to take expert testimony and get the jurors furious that the defense is even putting that stuff on. And that's where the kind of anger comes from. Let me end with the same caution. Your demonstration of anger to most jurors is like watching a nasty, irritating child have a tantrum. Don't do that. Stop telling jurors what to think and feel. Stop demonstrating it. Give them what they need to do it themselves and they'll do it. Push it down their throats by you showing it, especially on cross-examination, but really any time. And they will rebel against that. It's simply a human reaction. Irritation and anger in our face is just annoying and will we'll distance. But when you can get their anger directed at the defendant, that remains, after all these years of court reform, that anger remains one of the top two or three drivers of damages. That's why you can go way beyond what the usual verdict seems to be, usual damages verdict seems to be for court cases like this. Listen to David and take this in. This is huge. So it's easy to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know when, every time I read your book, I get something, oh yeah, that's what you mean by that. So what you just said is anger can motivate a jury verdict, but it's the juror's anger, not your anger. And when you put the anger in the room, you take it away from the jury. So that's huge. Uh, what you just said, I see a lot of trials where lawyers break that from the onset. So when if you come in and your opening says, look, they lied in their deposition, all you're doing is whining versus put that witness on first and let them lie to the jury. That's a huge difference, right? Well, what we do with experts is you learn the protocol for whatever the analysis was they were supposed to do. Uh, it's always a more intricate protocol yes. than you think. And you have an, your own expert on, you go first to talk about each thing that he's required or she's required to consider and gather all the information and then do this, that, and the other thing. It's not that complex. There's just a lot of it and explain by each, why each one of those things is important. And that every single person in this field is taught this from the time they take their first courses on it all the way through their careers. These are the things you need to do to find causation in criminal cases to decide which way the bullet came from or whose DNA or what, well, anything. There's a protocol. It's not like what I was being an English major. There's no protocol. It's being, and in fact, Dauberg requires because they have to use a, you have to use a method, recognized methodology that always includes like a checklist. And when you don't do that, you know, you are able to bend the verdict, to bend your, just your opinion any way you want. And when the jury can come to that conclusion on their own, they will punish the, the lawyer who sponsors us. If you give them the information, they can't tell on their own that the causation doctor violated the fundamental precepts of coming to a diagnosis. They don't, the jurors don't automatically know that people don't know the lay person doesn't know it. But it's knowable and you can learn it and you can use it as the foundation for really good crosses where you sit there being very professional or very calm and let the witness hang themselves and cross. And Great the, wisdom. His realization is they lied to us. Great wisdom. Um, thank you so much for uh, today's tip, David. Sure, Michael. Thanks for letting me. Let's take a deep breath together and be grateful to be alive this Thursday. May the work that we do today help reduce suffering in the world. May we repair the world in the work we do today. May we fiercely and compassionately advocate for our clients and champion their stories. I'm going to ring a bell three times now. This can take you into a meditation practice a prayer practice, or just remind you, it's Thursday, wake up, go out, do good things, and have fun while you're doing it. Have a great day.